Next up, we have a gentleman who uh, is, uh, I like to think of as a friend and a running buddy, but, but also once upon a time had hair as long as Jason's, back when he was in Southern California at Scripps. Uh, but, but, Mark, but Mark has been here now at uh, UW for many years, and uh, I, I think of Mark as a, as a great guy because he crosses boundaries in our little discipline of oceanography. He can claim to be a true chemical oceanographer and a physical oceanographer because he can connect the contents of your old refrigerators to global ocean circulation. Totally. <laughs> oh, so how does this work? Well, thanks for inviting me to uh, give a talk. Let's see, here's a lighter. So you're probably wondering how this all ties together. Rick gave me this title, so I'm going to run with it, try and explain my research. It all ties together through the chlorofluorocarbons, so named because there's a carbon and a couple of fluorines and a couple of chlorines attached to it. Um, these two compounds specifically, Freon-12 and Freon-11, are man-made and were trademarked by DuPont in the late 1920s because they made excellent refrigerants. They had low boiling point, they were non-toxic, non-reactive, non-corrosive, and they replaced things such as ammonium, which were really nasty to work with in refrigeration units. Um, these properties that they were non-toxic, non-reactive, and non-corrosive, said, people said, wow, they're cheap to make too. So there's lots of other uses. And by the time we get to the 1970s, um, the major use was as propellants. How many people remember spray on deodorants and things like that? So, um, and refrigeration was sort of a quarter of the percentage of, uh, um, of the production. And they were also used for blowing bubbles into foam, into styrofoam and closed cell building insulation foam. And um, that was fine. People thought these guys were inert. Um, in the 70s, there were some, the first global measurements in the atmosphere. And it was found that there was a, they were found globe to globe throughout the lower tropis, through the lower atmosphere. Um, 60 parts per trillion. People said, oh, that's no problem. But then there were some couple researchers at um, UC Irvine, Molina and Roland, who subsequently won a Nobel Prize for their, award, for their work, who recognized that that meant that the CFCs could get up into the stratosphere. And when they get up there, the, the ultraviolet radiation can pull off a, a um, a chlorine, which then can attack the ozone. Ozone is, this is the normal, where two oxygen, the oxygen two combines and forms oxygen three, which is ozone. Over here, this chlorine gets out and it breaks the, the ozone. Now, this is bad because the ozone layer in the stratosphere protects us from ultraviolet radiation and, and death to cells and mutations and all kinds of raises the risk of skin cancer. And so, being infinitely wise, we said, hmm, we'll stop using them as propellants. Um, until the 1980s when people said, oh look, there's an ozone hole developing around Antarctica and it's growing in, in extent, it's growing in duration, and it's getting thinner. And that led to a public outcry which eventually the Montreal Protocol in 1987 led to an eventual ban on the production of these CFCs. So that's the CFCs in the atmosphere. As oceanographers we said, wow, here's this nice stable compound, it's in the atmosphere, it's pretty well mixed, hey, we can see the atmospheric concentrations as a function of time. The red and the green are CFC 11 and CFC 12. This is concentration in parts per trillion. This is time. You can see nice exponential increase. There's this little blip when we started not using them as propellants. But they're pretty long lived and they kept increasing the atmosphere. So we recognize that the CFCs are gas. They're going to enter the surface ocean. Um, through gas exchange and their surface concentrations are going to be proportional to their concentrations in their atmosphere as a function of time. It's a little bit of solubility things and once water leaves the surface it's going to take with it a record of the CFCs at the surface at that time. And once they're conserved, nothing destroys them or creates them in the deep ocean. And the other thing that made these useful is we can routinely measure them in small volumes of samples at sea with a very low detection limit. So in the mid-1990s, um, we did a series of cruises. This is just up here. I'm going to show you two sections of CFC north-south in the Atlantic and Pacific oceans. Um, uh, in this, we've got um, depth, distance, north is over here, Antarctica is over here, and you can see generally uh, red and pink are high and green is low. You can see the bulk of the Pacific Ocean has no CFCs. CFCs have mixed down from the surface to about 1,000 meters um, in the 40 or 50 years from their introduction to the best time of the, the uh, measurements. 
The other thing is in the, when you get down near Antarctica where water gets cold enough to sink and flow to the bottom, it's actually bringing CFCs down to great depths. And the other thing that's different is you can see the North Atlantic is very efficient at bringing CFCs down to depth in that time period. Um, so not only can we follow the pathways of water that's uh, left the surface of the ocean and moved into the interior, we can also um, establish time because the, the CFC concentrations are proportional to the atmospheric concentrations. So you could just imagine projecting the having a water mass that you can establish what the atmospheric concentration was at that time, running it over on these source curves and running down and saying that water left the surface in 1983, it's 12 years old to get to where it is. And you can, can make maps of ages where you can see water masses are young, where blue's young, moving into the interior of the Atlantic and along the western boundary. And uh, you can get rates of spreading. Oh. Finally, the CFCs, you can, I would dance too, but um, you can see there's a wide variety of uses. We can use them as analogs for CO2. We can calibrate models. And the Montreal Protocol was a real success. It's one of those cases where citizens stood up and we changed uh, an environmental hazard. And it'd be nice to see us do the same for CO2. It helped that the chemical industry also had substitutes ready to go at the time. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Most